Harold Bishop was a 20-year-old coachsmith from Maruya. Like many men in a time of war, they risked everything they knew and loved, not for money or recognition, but to serve their country. They were volunteers from local families, from the cities and the bush. Soon Harold would find himself in a war where, for the first time, 19th century military tactics with 20th century technology became known as the Great War. He was an adventurous sort of a fellow and uh, he'd been in the this army reserve and because of his experience he, they promoted him to corporal two or three days after he joined the army. Uh, Harold did a lot of fighting, he did a lot of service, whereas Ray's time was very short. Harold uh, went away with the first wave of, of soldiers from, from Australia. He went to Egypt and they trained in Egypt and he was at Gallipoli. He landed at Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915. Uh, my dad said he, he went ashore in the second wave, in the first wave, the second wave, but it was on the morning of the, 20, of the 25th of April. Uh, he was promoted to sergeant or sergeant major at Gallipoli. It was very tough, Gallipoli, the, the circumstances and the lice and the rats and, and the heat and the cold, and it was just terrible. In the memorial gardens on the edge of the small beachside town of Turos on the New South Wales south coast stands a small pine. It's a symbol and reminder of the young men who left our shores to serve our country on the other side of the world. It is also a symbol of courage of Australians who took part in a battle that was one of the most brutal of the Great War. In August, his unit among many took part in the famous Battle of Lone Pine. Well, it's a horrendous battle and that's the, the, that's the importance of it. Um, it didn't make much sense strategically, except that it was drawing the... the, the, the British and their allies, the Anzacs, had to gain the high ground if they were to win the campaign. And they nearly did that on the 25th of April. And then they decided to have one last go in August. And to draw the Turkish defenders away from the high ground, they started a long way away, right down the other end of the battlefield at Lone Pine. Now, the, the, it, was, it was defended and it was reasonably heavily defended, but the Australians didn't realise it was a feint. They thought it was an important part of the battle structure. So they attacked in the afternoon, which is unusual. Uh, they rushed, Charles Bean, the official historian, tells us that you know they sort of rushed out of their lines. Some of them were in tunnels, actually, in the middle of no man's land, so they come out of the ground and ran towards the Turkish lines. And of course, the most dangerous thing to be doing. When they got there, Bean says they stopped. Like, the traffic lights had changed at Pitt Street or something. And there was this crowd of people just stopped. And that was because the Turks had lined the trenches with roof, the, uh, wood and mud. And they had to pull the, them out and then jump into the trenches and start the fight. The fight went on for three days and three nights. It was virtually underground, I mean, because the trenches were below ground. So they're fighting and they couldn't really use rifles much because um, you'd, shoot, you'd stood a good chance of shooting your own side as much as shooting a Turk. And so it was bare knuckle fighting, um, using rifle butts as clubs. It was the, the most brutal fighting Australians have ever been involved in. I mean, hand-to-hand -hand combat, actually. Three days, three nights, a lot of people killed. And the Turks withdrew when they could no longer bear to fight over the dead bodies of those who had already been killed. And people were standing on men who had been killed to continue the fight, and the Turks thought it's not worth it, and so they withdrew. And the Australians held Lone Pine, but it didn't make much difference strategically. Seven Australians were awarded the Victoria Cross for their actions during the fighting at Lone Pine. Of the Australian force that had launched the attack at Lone Pine, almost half became casualties. Australian losses during the Battle of Lone Pine mounted to 2,277 men killed or wounded, out of a total of 4,600 men committed to the fighting over the course of the battle. Later, Harold Bishop was injured and missed the evacuation from Gallipoli and went on to join his unit in France to become yet another tragedy of the Great War. It was, did a lot of fighting 
in the, the Battle of the Somme. And it was rather tragic because the Battle of the Somme, the Somme, it was their summer, you see, it's the northern summer, and as the northern winter approached, the fighting died down because they, they just couldn't get out and do it. And it was drawing to a conclusion and it was one of the last exercises in the Battle of, of the Somme that he was killed uh, near the uh, town of Fleur. Um, and that was, um, <coughs> he was killed on the 5th of November. The village of Fleur in the Somme Valley in France gave its name to a series of attacks launched by the Anzacs in November 1916. By this time, the Somme battlefield had been deluged with rain and snow. The attacks were made in atrocious conditions. The attacking waves of troops were sucked down by the cloying mud and thus, unable to keep up with their creeping artillery barrage, became easy targets for German machine gunners and riflemen. This was a battle that shouldn't have taken place. So it's winter now, and they more or less always suspended fighting in the winter because of the ridiculousness. I've been what's called the Australian, um, the AIF uh, Battleground Cemetery at Flair, and I've stood there in July with uh, tourists, uh, travellers, um, and it's been cold even then. It's, a, it's a, a woeful place. To be there in November and December is appalling, but you know, they conducted the battle in the snow. So how hard, hard do you think it was to hide? Uh, and so there were, uh, it was an unnecessary fight. It wasn't going to do much good at all. Um, but for some reason, the British ordered it, and, and so the Australians did it. As with many families in Australia, and indeed the Eurobadala, Harold had a younger brother who also enlisted, Raymond Charles Bishop. A 90-year mystery lingered through the family generations. Being the next generation, I only remember him as a photo on the wall. And uh, I guess our generation didn't, didn't puzzle about it that much. We knew it was there, we wish it was solved, but uh, we didn't have the same intensity of feeling, I guess, as his mum did and as his brothers and sisters did. Yeah, they always wanted to know. In 2013, the Bishop family invited Lambus Inglesus, historian, to the Maruya RSL Hall to tell his story in finding Raymond Charles Bishop. Lambus was instrumental in locating Pheasantwood, the burial site for the lost diggers of Fromel. The 19th of July 1916, the very first time that Australia goes into battle on the Western Front. This is VC Corner Cemetery. It is a unique cemetery. There are no headstones here. In the grounds of the cemetery, there are 410 Australian soldiers. Their bodies gathered after armistice. On the back wall of the VC Corner Cemetery is the honour roll to the missing of that one night's battle. Now, this remarkable photograph actually taken on the night of the battle. In some of the other photographs, you can actually see the shadows of the Australian soldiers as they advance across no man's land and as they huddle in the first German line and beyond. The whole idea of the Battle of Fromel, there was a feint to try and fool the Germans into thinking there was a major attack going to happen here so that they couldn't reinforce down on the Somme where the major battle had already begun and where Australians would attack on the 23rd of July at Pozier. So this was Haken's grand plan, try and fool the Germans into thinking there was a major attack going to happen here. We outnumber the Germans two to one. However, they have every advantage. The Germans have been here for a year and a half. The Australians have been here for one week. Brigadier General Pompey Yellett, an experienced Boer War and Gallipoli veteran, he was in charge of the 15th Brigade on Gallipoli as a colonel to the 7th Battalion. His men were awarded VCs at Lone Pine. He, uh, he saw the folly of this whole engagement and he had one of Haig's staff come down to view the battlefield before. And uh, he asked uh, this Major Howard, what's going to happen here? 
And the Major turned to Poppy, the Brigadier General, and said, I believe it will be a bloody holocaust, especially for the 15th Brigade. So he urged him to go back to tell Haig, to tell Haking, to at least postpone this battle. We weren't ready for it. However, at, uh, on the 19th of July at 6 o'clock, the Australians and the British attack. The Battle of Fromel was the worst day in Australia's history, bar none. 5,533 killed and wounded in the worst 24-hour period in Australia's history, a senseless slaughter led by the British commander, General Haking. Now, it is very easy sport, very easy Australian sport to denigrate British generalship. The notion of their 12 days back sending them into their test without really caring or doing their, their preparation carefully. This certain person up here is Sir Richard Haking. He was in charge of the Battle of Fromel. He was in charge of uh, the Battle of Oberz Ridge, the previous year's battle, fought over the same ground along a more extended front, which met with similar results. He even ordered the shelling of no man's land after the battle, ostensibly to stop any German counterattacks, but he must have known it would have been full of his own wounded men. His own British soldiers gave him the title of Butcher, Butcher Haking. However, the real reason why we like this photograph is this chap over here. History like research is fluid and ongoing. One day we'll find out who he is. He does have an excellent moustache. <laughs> so uh, we think he might be Hercule Poirot's uncle, but uh, we will find out who he is. But Butcher Haking, he was in charge of the Battle of Fromel. I would have court-martialed him. And Pompey Elliot would have court-martialed him too. And Pompey Elliott, who was commanding um, uh, a, a, an Australian outfit uh, brigade, uh, knew that if the plan was given to him, that it couldn't succeed and that it would result in murder. And that's what happened. 5,500 Australians became casualties at Fromel overnight. Ross McMullen, in his wonderful book on Pompey Elliott, uh, argues that that is probably the single worst day ever in Australian history, not Australian war history, in Australian history. It is the day of the greatest tragedy Australia ever endured for nothing. And the thing that annoys me about Haking is that despite that disaster and ill-conceived and criminally ill-conceived plan, he wasn't sacked, he was allowed to keep on going. And that shows you how reckless and careless British generals were in relation to the lives of men that they should have been caring for. And the one great difference between Australian commanders and commanders of other armies is that Australian commanders, and I don't care whether it's the First World War or the Vietnam War or any war in between or thereafter, Australian commanders have always been intensely aware of the fact that war will kill some of their men and they have always been determined to limit the loss as much as they could. I read recently a wonderful book by an Australian general, John Cantwell, who served in Afghanistan. Um, and he personally identified every one of his soldiers who were killed in war, personally identified them and personally attended, even though on two, I think two occasions, but certainly on one occasion, he was back in Australia. He flew back to Afghanistan so that he could be at the, at the point where the, the body was, was loaded onto the aircraft for return to Australia. That was his responsibility as the commander. And Australian soldiers have always been like that. And yet Haking recklessly threw away the lives of a couple of thousand Australians and made the entire 5,500 endure agony, which was unforgivable. Ask me about Sir Richard Haking, you won't get a very nice response. Now, one of the tragedies of Fromel was the fact that we knocked back the offer of a truce the morning after the battle. The dead and the wounded could have been gathered. However, the Australian General, General Mackay, said no to that offer of a truce. In the days after the battle, Sir Richard Haking is heard to say it has probably done the Australians a great deal of good. But perhaps even worse, the Australian General, General Mackay, the general who knocked back the offer of a truce, he could have shown some compassion for his men, certainly might not want to show any weakness in the face of the enemy, but he could have made a general's decision, a compassionate decision to allow the truce, the dead and the wounded could have been gathered. He was heard to say that they'll get used to it. What a thing for a general to say about his own men. Absolutely incredible.
He didn't call it truce because, in fact, there was now doctrine on that, and uh, he couldn't have. I mean, it's not possible. Um, you, you, you probably you know of the Christmas truce in 1914. The, the British decided this was hopeless for morale. Now, just look at what happened when they called a truce on Gallipoli. The Australians and the Turks got to know each other and got to like each other. And that's not very good if you've then got to get back into the opposing trenches and fight, which they did, of course, because they were loyal and, and they believed that that was the job they had to do. But I can see why he wouldn't have been able to do that, to have a truce to, to bury the dead. And, you know, their bodies were never recovered until after the war. It is just sickening. They were just lying out there. But that doesn't excuse what he said, nor does it excuse when he's at the Battle of Krithia and he yells at them. He gets out of the trench and yells at them, come on, Australians, come and die. You know, a man of great sensitivity. He was a very really well-qualified man. Uh, he... <laughs> I think, I think he was shot three times on the 25th of April. One bullet passed through his, his cap, one bullet was stopped by his diary. So it wasn't that he, he was prepared to lead from the front, but he, he didn't have the respect of the troops, uh, probably after about two days on Gallipoli and certainly not after Krithia, certainly not after Krithia. And what he was doing at Fremel's didn't matter. He wasn't in charge. The man who mattered for the Australians was Pompey Elliott, and at least he had the grace and decency to be in tears when the, the few returning men were coming back. And Charles Bean caught up with him the next morning. Bean had been down. He didn't even know the battle was going to take place. Nobody bothered to tell him. So he, as soon as he heard about it, he rushed out from breakfast and hopped in a car and went up to Fromell. And he came across Pompey Elliot, and he writes in his diary, Elliot had the look of a man who had just lost his wife. He was so distraught at what had happened to his troops. And he never really recovered. And you know that he did eventually suicide, um, and that is a direct outcome of what happened at Fromell. We would now call it PTSD, and we would do everything we could to help him, uh, but he was irrecoverable, sadly. Even though he'd had, a, back in Australia, he'd had a very good career, including being a member of the federal parliament. And yet he couldn't get over what had been done to his troops at Fromell. The German salient at Fromel contained some higher ground facing northwest known as the Sugarloaf. The small size and height of the salient gave the Germans observation of no man's land on either flank. The main feature on the battlefield that evening was this thing here, the Sugarloaf salient. There is no height to it as such, it just butts out into no man's land, but because of that, they have the entire field to their right and the entire field to their left. The machine gun on the corner of the Sugarloaf State was uh, the machine gun which accounted for the majority of Australian losses that night because it can shoot the entire length of no man's land. Now you can see this line. It's more than just a virtual line. Haken decided to have a buffer zone between the Australians and the British in front of the major German stronghold. He could have told the British, you take the Sugarloaf, or the Australians, you take the Sugarloaf, but what he does, effectively, is draw this line in the 20 yard buffer zone so there's no interdivisional contact. Yet another absolute stupidity. At 8.25, Haking ordered another attack on the Sugarloaf, but the British tell him, the British General McKenzie says, we are too badly knocked around, we cannot do it. That message does not get through to Pompey Gillian. The machine guns have been set at grazing height, so you get clipped at the knees and you hit multiple times as you go down. They cannot get to the objective, it is an impossibility. But at 9 o'clock, 35 minutes, a notice could have been got through to Pompey. Two companies, 400 men of the 58th Battalion, go out against the Sugarloaf and meet with a similar fate. At 59th, 60th, 53rd, and 54th, for the 55th Battalion and Ray Bishop, they were in support. They went over and across many times, bringing up machine guns, bullets, bombs and the like, sandbags. They were in support of the 53rd and 54th. So Ray was somewhere up here because they got into the German lines. They got beyond the German lines. And uh, Nazi Bolt of the 55th Battalion, another of Ray's group, because um, in the morning the call came, get back if you can. Nazi stayed in his post, accounted for five Germans before he was overpowered and killed. Similarly, Ray went forward with bombs to allow time for his uh, clubbers to get back if they could. Because by the morning, the call had come, get back if you can, 
There's islands of Australians in the Sea of Germans, as, uh, as Carline describes it. Men are being surrounded and picked off because, because of the failure here, the 15th Brigade can't get across. The Germans can move all the way along and into the ground where the 55th Battalion were and pick these soldiers off. As a result of in-depth research by Lambus and his dogged determination to locate the missing soldiers and many months of investigation by Australian, British and French governments, a vital piece of evidence found in the Bavarian military archives, the commander of the German 21st Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, von Braun, ordered the digging of a mass grave behind Pheasant Wood and provided instructions about how it was to be done. Again, possibly the very last photograph of our soldiers before their burial. Here they are, interestingly enough, in the shade of a line of trees or the edge of a wood. As you may have noticed, many of these soldiers have been covered by German ground sheets to protect them from the sun. They must get these bodies underground for health reasons alone. They must bury these bodies. But here, I sent away to London to the Imperial War Museum to get uh, photographs looking for anomalies in the ground behind the German lines. 17th of June 1916, there's that light rail cutting through the corner of the wood and before the wood, absolutely no digging at all. Then, 10 days after the battle, clear evidence of sustained earthwork. By Christmas time 1916, the Germans had dug eight pits. They filled in five. By the end of the war, when the villagers come back, they see the three empty pits expunge the memory of the war, get on with their lives, they fill in those three empty pits, unaware of what might be in the, in the ground, very close by. Here we have a close-up of the 1918 photograph, the end of the war. I believe you can detect some height in the two pits closest to the wood. Here we have a modern-day photograph of the site. Some undulation in the ground, not empirical evidence in itself, but um, eventually we were invited to Canberra, uh, to make our case to an expert panel of historians and military people. And uh, we made our case suggesting that um, those pits were possibly and most likely to be uh, burial pits. Some of these experts said they're probably gun pits. Now, again, I'm not a military man, like the Sugarloaf said. I don't know why they didn't isolate that with continuous shell fire. But here, I can't see how or why you'd build a gun pit so close to the edge of a wood with a clearance of a metre and a half. It just didn't seem to make sense. Then uh, I read through all 1,336 files to the missing in the Red Cross files. And in this particular file, Jack Bowden's file, the only one in all 1,336 that mentioned a place called Pheasant Wood. And here it is, documentation from 1918 saying that Jack Bowden could be buried in one of five collective mass graves before Pheasant Wood or in the mass grave at Fawn Military Cemetery, which was we now know is recovered in 1923. So here's documentation saying that he was buried at Pheasant Wood. This was his document. What the Germans did when they gathered the bodies, they took the ID discs off the bodies, recorded their names, anything that was not of any military value, cigarette cases, watches and the like, they bagged them and through the Red Cross they sent them back to Australia which was a remarkable process. What it did, it gave us the names of the soldiers that they had buried. In the case of Jack Bowden, it told us where they'd buried them. Well, after they'd discovered the, 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 the mass graves and they'd confirmed that, that there were bodies there, and um, after a long battle, Lambus finally got people to accept that, the authorities. Then the question arose, do they exhume the bodies or do they let them stay where they were? And that, that's an interesting question in itself. Um, at one of our family reunions, I remember we were having dinner one night and there was about 20 or 25 of the fam extended family members there. And um, uh, I was just giving them an update on the Framel story and, and Ray. And I made the point that they'd been discovered, but the question would arise, should they, the bodies be exhumed or should they be left to rest? And I asked for a show of hands and everybody voted in favour of leaving them where they were, except one, and that was Uncle Bill. <laughs>
And when I looked around the room, I realised that Bill was the only ex-serviceman in the room from World War II. Um, a week or so later, back home, um, at our Probus Club, and I'd been keeping the Probus members up to date on the Fromell story, and I posed the same question there. And the whole club voted in favour of leaving them there, except three or four. And when I looked at those three and four, they were all ex-servicemen from World War II. And I thought, they might be in the minority, but I think it's the right thing. So at that point, I changed my mind. And I was in favour of them being exhumed and given their own point. And Lambus had that view all along. He must have been smarter than I was, because I... But that was the point when I changed my mind. And they also found uh, in the German archives in Munich a document dated two days after the battle in which it said, you will dig before Pheasant Wood for 400. So there was no more evasive smoke. It wasn't a gun pit. It had been used for burial purposes. If it hadn't been recovered, clearly the men were still there. Me, with my clever technology, it's about all I can handle. This is always going to be Plan 61B, Peter Reese, but having followed you, Due and official and careful process, we didn't require to go to Plan 61B. Plan 61B, I go to Le Bunnings in Paris and get a shovel, a flashlight, a balaclava and a good French lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> However, that wasn't necessary. The Australian government had engaged Tony Pollard to go there with his clever technology, that is ground penetrating radar. They sent pulses into the ground and they used sophisticated metal detectors. January the 30th, 2010, they built a brand new cemetery. The Pheasant Wood site was uh, too water prone. So they built a brand new cemetery very close to the village. On January the 30th, 2010, the very first of the burials. Here we have one of our own carried in by his own to his dignified burial. Over a three week period, they buried 249 soldiers. They held one soldier over for ceremonial burial on the 9th of July, 2010, the anniversary of the battle, the day that the cemetery would be Opened, a newly formed task force created by governments of the day and organisations to oversee an archaeological evaluation of the suspected burial sites and eventual exhumation and reburial of the lost diggers of Fromel. For more than 90 years they were counted among the missing of the First World War. Soldiers from Britain and Australia who fought in the Battle of Fromel in northern France but never returned. Now some of those recently discovered in a mass grave have been given a proper burial and on the anniversary of the battle families gathered to open the cemetery where their relatives have now been laid to rest. The Battle of Fromel was short and brutal an assault on German frontline positions that cost the lives of more than 7,000 Allied troops. For Australia, which lost more than 5,000 men, it's still the worst 24 hours in the country's military history, an episode many are determined to remember. These brave young men left Australia on an adventure and they never got back, so the least we can do is come here and pay our respects to them. The opening of the cemetery is the culmination of two years of research and excavation work, in which the remains of some 250 soldiers were exhumed. Now in their new resting place, they're regaining their place in history. For Jeff Bishop, it was a sombre moment, knowing Raymond Bishop was now located and finally had a grave. For a young man from a small town in Maruya, it was a 94-year journey. So Harold did a lot more active service um, than Ray. Ray's story was um, much shorter. Um, it was only 10 months from the time he enlisted until the time he was killed. That's, that's tragic. Um, he'd only arrived in France about three weeks before he was killed. The inscription reads, his memory, oh it's got his name and, and uh, uh, number, R.C. Bishop, 55th Battalion, um, 
and the inscription says, his memory cherished by all who loved him and honoured by those who follow. 20, 20 years of age, didn't even get to his 21st birthday. Tragic, absolutely tragic.